If you've watched any number of movies in the past, you've probably been exposed to the distinct color palette of each. From the dark blues from The Dark Knight, to the brilliant oranges in Mad Max, colors everywhere in film. Although a seemingly trivial topic, the process to create these specific looks is vital in the post-production workflow which I often deal with, and is known as color grading, which, surprisingly enough, makes heavy use of matrices. To understand what color grading actually is and why it even uses matrices, we need to understand computer color and how it's represented. In this video, we'll be using RGB. RGB, as most of you know, stands for red, green, and blue. The corresponding values represent the relative color value of that channel in each pixel. An abstraction that might help you visualize RGB better it is viewing it as a cube, with each axis representing a different value in the RGB space. So, how do matrices play into RGB? Well, as some of you may have already guessed, the RGB color space can be represented as a cube in R3, with each pixel being represented as a vector within R3 pointing to its corresponding color. So, bringing this to color grading, each pixel in an image can now be mapped to a vector that points to a different point in our cube. To alter the colors, all we need to do is apply transformations to our vectors that point the vectors to different colors. With this approach, multiple color transformations become trivial, simply requiring the composition of the transformational matrices. This method is not without its drawbacks, however. One problem that might need to be addressed is the possibility of vectors pointing outside of the space um, defined by our cube. Although a seemingly serious issue, this is something we can overcome relatively simply by just limiting our possible values and assigning maximum values to anything outside of our cube, effectively clipping them. Think of this how your camera will clip the highlights if it, something gets overexposed. So what does a really practical implementation of this look like? Well, to start, let's look at some footage that we actually want to color grade. We'll perform a relatively simple grade on this, simply just adding some saturation and a slight tint to the shadows and highlights. First off, we need to increase our saturation. This requires a somewhat complex operation. Colors are more saturated along the axial faces of cubes, meaning that we actually need to transform each vector to be closer to its corresponding faces. Identifying the corresponding faces isn't as difficult as it sounds, though. We simply just need to use the dot product to get the angle between the vector and each axis. Then we can just use these angles to create a rotation matrix to rotate the vector, with the exception of the grayscale and completely saturated vectors, to the more saturated areas of the cube. With the saturation added, now we need to tint the shadows. A common color to tint shadows is teal, since it complements the skin tones in the image nicely. So how do we select the shadows? Well, one thing we can do is only manipulate vectors that have a certain length or less. We can find this length with the Pythagorean theorem. Since the shorter vectors are closer to our black point, it only makes sense that they would also be our shadows. Now all we need to do is create a transformation matrix that shifts the desired shadow value from the grayscale line to a dark teal section of the cube. All that's left are the highlights. A common highlight tint is orange as it complements the teal that we added into the image. As you may have guessed, all we need to do now is select vectors greater than a certain length and create a transformational matrix that moves them towards a light orange section of our cube. In addition to just being able to color grade an image, an upside to this approach we haven't discussed yet is precision. As cameras shoot higher and higher quality video, they often raise a parameter known as bit depth, or the number of possible colors in an image. For example, in an 8-bit image, there are only 256 possible values per color channel. Compare this to 12-bit, which can offer a staggering 4,096 possible values per color channel. With methods that don't utilize the linear algebra approach, using an 8-bit grade on a 12-bit image will result in a loss of data since the grade cannot accurately account for the extra data being fed into it, resulting in an artifact known as color band. Compare this to the linear algebra approach, which deals purely with vectors and vector transforms. Since it deals with these, grades are universal and because of their practically unlimited possible bit depth being supported and the unlimited resolution of matrices and vectors. So that's really how color grading works from a linear algebra standpoint. Although some techniques such as limiting the possible colors might not be strictly based in linear algebra, the entire concept of representing as colors as vectors 
and then using matrices to transform them shows the flexibility afforded by utilizing a linear algebra approach. In summary, colors can be approached in a variety of manners, but the linear algebra approach holds the benefits of being easy to use, easy to visualize, and also viable for a long ways into the future. Thanks for watching.